All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Misfit Nation. If you have not had a chance to check out our first book, 13 Step Guide to Success, it is available on Amazon and Kindle and paperback version. If you are going through some hard times and you just don't know where to turn, turn to a friend, chat with them. If you're afraid to chat with your friend because you're embarrassed or you don't want to be a burden to them, call the crisis hotline at 1-800-273-8255. If you are a veteran, press option one. Do not make a permanent solution to a temporary problem. If you're a new listener, we appreciate you joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast apps. Also, download the Military Broadcast Radio app to follow our family of shows. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Underscore Misfit Nation. This will keep you up to date with the latest episodes of The Misfit Nation and also allow you to hear the amazing stories and journeys of our guests. Speaking of which, our next guest is a multi-award winning executive coach and author who specializes in the mind-body approach to helping professionals find a way of being that embodies synergy, authenticity, and trust. Operating out of Singapore and Toronto, he is both a neuroscientist and a spiritualist who believes that the greatest leaders are those who are able to effortlessly blend science and spirituality. So without further ado, let's welcome to the Misfit Nation, Marcel Donna. How are you, Marcel? I'm great, thank you, and thank you for having me. Oh, it's great that we can uh, connect, and uh, I got you in between your flights, I guess, between uh, Singapore and Toronto, because yep. it's, it's good to make that connection, and in, in this digital world we live in now, it's awesome that we can do this, and I, love I, can, I can reach out and grab you and bring you on here to, to help talk about some better ways to lead in this world where we hear nothing, nothing more than there's a lot of horrible bosses out there, and that could be for multiple reasons, but we hear about them. How do we stop that from happening? And I'm glad to have you on and pumped to have you on the show to talk about. It. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, and, and the, the interesting thing is, is, you know, I've, I've been a horrible boss myself. Right. So, uh, but, you know, but, but backtracking a little bit, I love your opening of the show and, and, and I'm an, I'm a veteran as well. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why I got into mindfulness and I got into, you know, energy work was because I struggled to, to reintegrate into, uh, into society. And, uh, you know, there, there's no handbook on, <laughs> on how to integrate into, into society. And I, and I found that flabbergasting when I, when I left the military, you know, there was nobody there anywhere. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not American, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch, but even, even for us Dutch people in the military, I spent 10 years in the military, was completely, you know, kind of in, like my, my, my development years as a young adult was in the military. And I, and I came out of the military and, and there, was, there was just no guidance. There was nothing for me to, I, I had to figure it out all by myself. So I can, I can only imagine, right, how, how difficult it must be if you're on top of that, if you're dealing with all types of challenges of, you know, PTSD and from, you know, coming back from, you know, war-torn areas, how much more difficult it must be for you. So, um, so thank you for, for, you know, opening the show with that because I think it's a very, very relevant and very important uh, subject. Awesome. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Marcel, thank you for your service. Uh, I didn't know you, you served as well uh, in the uh, mm -hmm. Dutch, Dutch Army, I'm guessing, or Dutch Marines. Yeah, it was it was actually in the in, in the Navy. I was I was in naval intelligence. So oh, this nice. and this was during the during the Soviet era. Yeah. <laughs> so I was I was a pencil pusher. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but but you know, the, it, it, even so, I, you know, I, I think the one thing that that sets us apart, you know, people who come from the military, regardless of what country they're from, um, is is the the sense of purpose is very clear. Right, you know, when we're in the military, and I, and that's something I needed when I was a kid. I, I actually, I, I didn't really know it then, but I, I struggled with mental illness to start with, and I had a lot of anxiety and depression, and I took life way too seriously as a kid, and um, and I was, I, I, I was struggling with, with you know, having some form of direction, some form of guidance, and that's one thing that the military really helped me with, right? You know, they, it gave me structure, it taught me discipline, um, but it also taught me purpose. And, and it's incredible when everybody in the same unit is operating with the same purpose in mind. And it's, it's surprisingly easy to get up at the, you know, the weirdest times at night or, you know, when you're in the graveyard shift or, you know, whatever it is. And you're, um, it, it's surprisingly easy to do all of these uncomfortable things when everybody is aligned with where they're going, right? And what, and what needs to be done for this job. And that the job has meaning. 
And I think that's that's a really important thing, right? Because for me, it was about being able to, you know, be of service to my country. And I wanted to be of service to my country before I did anything else in my life. And um, and I think that's that's such an important piece that we then end up missing because in, in the civilian life, right, you know, there are there are so many different meanings and so many different purposes of people, and you know, and it's and it, it can be very overwhelming and very confusing to try to, you know, to try to fit in, right? So, uh, so, and that's and that's something that I found even when you know I started working on my own, and um, I actually the one job that I could hold because I got fired from pretty much every job that I that I tried to try to kind of get hired into. And I'm sure a lot of you know fellow military people can resonate with that. But I tried sales jobs and office jobs and all of that, and none of it stuck with me. I just it just didn't excite me in the same way. And um, and and it was it was interestingly that I that I got introduced to personal training because it was something that I was passionate about, which was which was you know physical training and physical fitness, mental fitness, um, you know, and and I be, I became a, a personal trainer, and that's what triggered me into uh, you know really enjoying that process of working with people and helping them become better, and that's what over the past 30 years of my evolution, I'm 56 now, and over the past 30 years, that's kind of, you know, where I am today, still helping people evolve. I'm just doing it in a different area with regards to, you know, working with professionals and leaders and all of these kind of, you know, people. Um, but, but along the way, right, you know, I tried to do, you know, kind of try to fit in and do what was supposed to be, you know, kind of our definition of success. And I, I started my own business. I actually opened Southeast Asia's largest um, athletic training facility. This was, you know, slightly, slightly before CrossFit. But if you would have looked at the gym, it would have been, you know, very, I was still very much in that operational readiness kind of mode. So for me, an athlete has to be operationally ready at all times. And so, um, so, so the gym was, was designed with that format in mind. And, and we worked with kids, you know, much more so than with, with adults to, you know, prepare them for, you know, college sports and, and all of those kind of things. And, and, um, and it wasn't during that period of time where, you know, I actually had my first taste to being a boss myself because, um, you know, here I had, I invested all of my savings and my wife and I, we, we put all of our savings into this business. We had three other um, investors as well. And, uh, and all of a sudden I had, you know, I was kind of, you know, my own kind of personal trainer guy. And all of a sudden I had this big business and 15 trainers working for me and marketing staff and all of this kind of stuff. And, and, and to be honest, I didn't handle it very well. I, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared <laughs> for, for, that, that kind of you know growth that it was a steep learning curve and um and and I, one of the reasons why you know i failed as as a leader as a, as a boss back then and why i became a horrible boss is because i was so invested emotionally as well in in making this business successful that um that i also became inflexible in how that business could grow because i you know I, I i lost my sense of adaptability to you know market demands and all of these kind of things because it, it just became my way or the highway because i was so passionate about it and, that, and it's something i write in my book right you know the five energies of horrible bosses is um, you know passion and purpose can be a double-edged sword, right? Because when we take it too seriously, when we get so emotionally invested in our purpose, it can take away the fun, right? It can really kind of take away the the enjoyment of of what we're pursuing to a point where people actually don't think it's fun to be around us either, because we're taking everything so seriously. And that was me. I was a, I was a great example. Of that and and I did that for a few years and after after a few years I woke up one day and go this is not me I don't like who I am you know it's like I can't imagine what my staff and what my partners must think but I don't like who I am and and so I ended up quitting the business and uh, and actually I ended up selling it off and go you know this is not for me and uh, and I learned through that experience that that no matter how good you think you are as a leader or as a boss, there is always somebody out there who thinks you're a horrible boss, right? right? So that so the concept of of and I and I sometimes get remarks about this from you know people who haven't read the book yet, and they're like, oh, but you know, but I, I consider myself a great boss. I say exactly that's the problem, right? Because there is somebody out there actually who thinks you suck. 
And, um, and, and, and if we're not aware of that, if we're not aware that there are situations in which, in which we, you know, we aren't necessarily the ideal leader for somebody that we need to be, at least we need to be able to do that with some level of consciousness, right? You know, to be consciously aware of actually how we're showing up and how we're leading. And so, and so the premise of the book really comes around is, is what type of leader are you choosing to be? And are you consciously showing up as that type of boss or type of leader? And, and the way that I frame that is, is using, you know, um, cause I'm almost a lifelong martial artist and, and using, um, using martial arts as a bit of an, an analogy is we project different types of energy. This comes from, you know, kind of spirituality. It also comes from, um, the Asian, you know, health practices like Ayurvedic medicine and, and, um, you know, Tai Chi, Chi Kung and traditional Chinese medicine is that we, we project energy in a certain way. And actually when, when we show up, when I'm, for example, if I'm hungry or I'm tired or I'm something like that, um, I show up in a different energy than when I'm in a really good mood, for example. Right. And, um, and so we project these different energies all throughout the day in different situations. But, the, but the, the key is, is to be actually aware of the energy that we're projecting. So rather than just kind of being a slave to our circumstances and just finding ourselves in a certain energy and hoping that that might um, appeal right, to a certain percentage of the people that work for us, we can also say, hey, I can use this as a tool and I am actually going to shift my energy in a way that actually gets lasting results, right? That really kind of you know, makes an impact in a lasting way, which we're, where I can hit the largest percentage of people that, that work with me or whether they're clients or whatever it is, um, and, and therefore create greater success for myself. And so there's a beautiful tie-in between, between that energy that we're actually aware of that we, that we project and the impact that that makes on the people that we live with, that we work with, and all of that kind of stuff. And that's what that's what motivated me to write the book because as I've you know been been working with leaders for the past you know 12, 13 years, um, I've I've discovered the same thing is that you know is that they might find themselves in a certain energy, but that one type of energy doesn't cater to that entire population of people that they might be working with or living with. And, um, and so, so becoming a little bit more adaptable and agile and how we project energy and being aware of that, you know, so that we, we, when we step into a room, we know what kind of energy we're bringing into that meeting, into that situation or whatever, whatever it is that there might be. And then how we can use that energy to, um, to create the results that not only that we want, but also, you know, that, that are also beneficial to the other party. So, so that's kind of the premise of, of the book. That's outstanding. And I think you hit a lot of key points on there, uh, finding a sense of purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you, you alluded to uh, earlier, the veteran, the veteran sphere, a lot of people, even like yourself, when you got out, you don't know how to find that sense of purpose because you didn't have someone right next to you on your right or left that you mm -hmm. wanted to do stuff for. And then the same thing happens, even in the corporate world, as you go from being the person at the entry level, as you move up to middle management and management, you have to keep that sense of pur purpose and also a passion for what you're doing while you're there that because your energy will drain if you're not passionate about what you're doing. And then exactly. that's when mistakes really happen. And I think a lot of people miss that when they say, I want that promotion because it's going to be awesome for my bank account, but it's not awesome for your heart or your head because it, right. it's, there's nothing there for you. So yeah. what do you think? Yeah, that is that is the double-edged sword right you right. know is is it's it's almost like a like a like a goldilocks zone where <laughs> where there's having that right amount of passion but then there are also these people who are like too passionate and that can cause burnout as well right you know and so and so when we you know when we're too passionate and therefore take things too seriously it's almost like what we're doing becomes a life or death situation and of course it, it never is right you know it's like uh, you know the, the amount of leaders that i talk with who who talk about their business of you know losing you know two percent profit is like you know life or death and it's like right. no it's two percent profit it's not it's not you know it's, it's 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 nothing right you know and and i i always use a saying that comes out of the military is you know something that we always talk about i remember my drill sergeant always saying that is you know and if nobody died today you're having a really good day <laughs> you know and and i and i still use that analogy right you know is is um we 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 have to be 
aware of of that our passion right the things that we are passionate doesn't necessarily mean it's other people's passion or that other people are, are as as purposeful and as passionate as we are and this is where a lot of leaders tend to get it wrong there tends to be this expectation this this standard of satisfaction say i'm only going to work with people who are you know equally passionate as 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 i am and and as much as of a driving force that can be for me it doesn't mean it's the same same for everybody else, right? You know, and that's, and I think that's the double-edged sword. And you're absolutely right. Without purpose, without passion, where do we go, right? You know, it was like when I walked into, into civilian life and there, and there are plenty of people who live without purpose and passion. Yes. And, they're, and, they're, and they're just in that other end of that spectrum. We're just completely lost. Right. You know, just have no idea where they're going. And then there are uh, people who are like have too much of it and they're just constantly stressed out and they're and they're, you know, at the verge of burnout. And, you know, and they and to them, it's like it's like they're in the trenches of life. Right. You know, trying to trying to make a buck and trying to, you know, trying to get ahead. And they treat it as if they're in Afghanistan, right. you know, and and, you know, in, in warfare, which, of course, it isn't. You know, it's, it's very different. And, um, and and that's and that's the I think that's the challenge. Right. Is how do you how do you find that midway? How do you find that that right amount of of passion right amount of purpose but not go overboard and that's something i had to learn i i you know it took me it took me a long time a lot of awareness <laughs> and i and i burnt out twice from it right you know so i've i've achieved <laughs> hallelujah i've achieved you know um burnout like literally you know physical mental emotional burnouts uh two times in in, in my life and it takes a long time to recover from from burnout and both times it was driven by me taking life way too seriously, right? You know, and uh, and that's and that's the you know that's a double edged sword that I you know also want to want to highlight. That's all definitely great stuff right there. Uh, in today's world uh, where everything's so fast paced and and something can happen to press of a button on my computer here, uh, what are leaders missing the most in this new high speed technical world that we're in now? Oh yeah, fantastic um, space. That's that's a space. That's that's a, and what I what I what I mean with that is is leaders need space. They need they need the opportunity to have visibility, to be able to to be able to see things, feel things, hear things, experience things in ways that other people don't so that they can, you know, kind of drive the organization forward, right? Using, using not only what we like to call the knowing pillar, right? But also the feeling and the sensing pillars that are so important in leadership. And what I mean with that is, is if you look at the majority of businesses today, because there is no space, right? The majority of businesses run on data. And you will you will hear from any person who you know is is a you know fortune you know number um, you know leader is you know data is the most important factor that decides whether or not a company is successful or not. And, um, and the challenge with data is that data is very black and white, right? And so you will see organizations, every single department from HR to sales, to like, the thing that they're doing is accumulating data, right? And that data has to get analyzed and they have departments of people and computer systems that analyze data that kind of says, hey, listen, you're, you're growing or you're not growing. And, you know, and you're, you're, you know, from a customer service perspective, you're, you know, you're ranked here where you could really be here and, you know, what can that all do? And so, and so companies have become, and including leaders, have become over-reliant on data, right? And so the data dictates where they're going. And um, the unfortunate thing about data is that it leaves out the human element, right. right? And if you look at any company or any organization, no matter how big or how small it is, the most important factor that's gonna determine success for an organization is the quality of interactions in the least amount of time. And what I mean with that is that if you have a team of people that have really healthy, great conversations about what they're doing and how they're doing it, and they brainstorm together and all of these kinds of stuff, that team collectively is going to be able to accomplish more in less time. 
right? And so it's not a, it's not effectiveness is not driven in in num numbers of data, but it is actually in numbers of interaction quality, or what I like to call the interaction quotient of an organization, right? So how how that how that quality is now. That, that interaction quotient, the quality of those interactions can only happen if people have the space to interact. And how many times don't we hear from people say, listen, I would love to send a person a five sentence email starting off with how you're doing, but I don't have the time because I have 300 other emails that I have to write, right? right? You know, within a certain time. So, so what happens is the emails become one word emails. And, um, and of course, there's, there's not a lot of interaction quality that happens with a one word email. There's a lot of misinterpretation that can happen with that. And so, so when, when people don't have space, the quality of the interactions decreases, right? They become drones, they become machines. That are that are operating in this space, and um, and and all they need is time and space, and just and just to be able to take a breath, right? And just to be able to have that clarity and um, and the ability, you know, the opportunity for them to breathe is often not even there. And so, so I would say that if you are a leader in an organization or even a boss, and you find yourself in an environment where you're not taking you're not you're not creating space for yourself right or you're not given an opportunity to create space for yourself there's an issue and and that needs to be addressed because every single person who works for the organization has the right to space and um and that and that space only leads to greater things it leads to creativity it leads to great ideas it leads to communication it leads to collaboration all of the things that we want and by the way yes that does translate into better data too right you know but way better than than what you're currently basing on and so so what we're what we're seeing in organizations is that companies are hiring people who are very data centric and they rely on that data and, um, and, and these are often what we call managers, and these people manage the data. And they're conditioned through how they grow up, how they're educated, all of these kind of things. They're conditioned to operate in, in, in data first, then kind of like what, they're, what they feel about that data, and then what they're sensing. And this is what I call the three pillars of wisdom. The three pillars of wisdom are, are knowing, feeling, and sensing. And it's our ability to use all three of those holistically that really drives the most amount of wisdom. But when we're only data centric, we very often don't, we don't even trust the other two pillars of feeling and sensing, basically the heart and the gut, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't trust the heart and the gut because we can't quantify it. We can't put data to it. And so we say, okay, let's just focus what's in the head, right? You know, and that's, and that's the stuff that we might know from the data that we have. And so managers, as they grow in the organization, they tend to get hired on their ability to be very data centric. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you look at leaders and you look at entrepreneurs, they, their brains have to operate differently. They can't be so data centric. They have to be the opposite. They have to, they have to work with their gut first, then their hearts and then their heads. They have to be sensing, feeling, and then knowing. So they sense something and they kind of go, hey, what does that feel like to me? Hey, that's a good idea. That's where vision comes from. That's where creativity and ideas come from. And then they say, then they say okay, now how can the data support what I'm feeling and what I'm sensing? And that's really important for an entrepreneur too, because as an entrepreneur, you know, we have an idea. We don't know if the idea works. There's no data to support that. It's just like, oh, I have an idea and I think the idea is awesome, right? You know, and so so the, our gut tells us that this is something that we need to do. So entrepreneurs are the opposite. And so what I find is that for managers to become leaders, they struggle with the transition from going, be, going data centric to being kind of sensing centric, right? As, as where entrepreneurs, they're the opposite. They tend to be sensing centric first, but as the business grows and they do need to start learning how to use data, that be, can become a very difficult thing for them. So they often don't know how successful their business really is. They don't know how well the business is running because they haven't learned to work with the data, you know? And so, and so for, for, for entrepreneurs and leaders, or, you know, they, they, they might be in the same space of being kind of, you know, in that, in that gut heart to head. 
as where managers who are evolving go from you know head, uh, heart, and gut, and um, and learning how to make that transition is a very important thing for both managers who become leaders and for entrepreneurs who become leaders of, of organizations as well. And they both struggle in that space. And for them, they need space. They need that awareness. They need the mindfulness. They need consciousness. They need all of these kind of things to be able to consciously being able to you know, access and train themselves to be able to access things like their intuition and their gut feelings and all and, the, and their emotions as well, right? As where, as where for entrepreneurs, it's more about training kind of that that left side of the brain to be a little bit more analytical and a little bit more strategic and that and they need space for that training as well and when we don't give ourselves that space we don't have the opportunity to cross over and when we don't cross over it hurts the business exactly you've been you've had an opportunity to train a lot of corporate leaders industry leaders and up and coming coaches executives if you can coach one leader in our great big marble here in the world who would you love to coach and why? I would I would love to coach. There are, there are actually two people that I, I would love to coach, and I, I use this a lot. Um, but the one that I would love to work with right now is Joe Biden. And um, and one of the reasons is, is I, I really believe that um, Joe Biden is a certain type of leader. And I'm not talking about his political views. I'm just talking about his leadership style as a certain type of leader that projects a certain type of energy. It's the energy that we call inviting energy. And what that means is he likes to he likes to lead from a from perspective of taking in perspectives and basically allowing other people, giving other people space to lead and to be, you know, kind of because a great leader can also be a great follower in certain times and and so he tries to emulate that and he tries to be that kind of leader where joe biden struggles is that opposite end of the spectrum which is i like to call a determined leader so that is where where we need to put determined energy into being steadfast and to be able to make strong decisions and, and come out with that in a very powerful way and be able to kind of really exert that energy almost like a war cry right you know kind of like hey this is this is where we're going i am sparta type you know kind of a, a approach and 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 he struggles in that space you can see it when he's on tv when he's like he has struggles to just project that kind of energy and the interesting thing is is that's a skill it's not it's not something that that we're either born with or not with he can learn how to do that right you know it's just it's just a matter of whether or not he's willing to to practice being able to be that might more kind of determined energy type leader right and so so he he, he might have great inviting energy but he doesn't necessarily have great determined energy and a, and a leader has to have both the same with the other uh, the two you know two other energies are, are what i call light energy and heavy energy light energy is somebody who can have fun who can enjoy themselves who can enjoy the process who can be spontaneous who can be a little bit carefree on the other hand um you know there's on the other end of the spectrum is 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 heavy energy which is being grounded being you know kind of you know doing doing the right thing and following the right procedures and and all of that kind of stuff. And so so the two two energies that I see in Joe are really are really kind of inviting and heavy energy. That's kind of where he lives. But but I don't think he spends a lot of time in, in determined light energy. And I think if he expanded himself in that space a little bit, he would get very different results and 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 what what he's doing right as where for example if you look at at a leader like donald trump who you know of course the previous president um he was more kind of determined light right you know so he was more kind of you know doesn't really care too much about long-term consequences he, he kind of has, wants to have fun right but at the same time he also wants to be determined and and, and so so there's a population of people who who you know love him for that Right. You know, um, but he could benefit from maybe being a little bit more inviting and a little bit more heavy. So playing with that energy as well. And so what we see in most leaders, right, is that is that most leaders um, are good at one or two of them, but they're not good at all five. And the fifth one, by the way, is neutral energy. And that's that sits right in the middle. And that's that state of mindfulness, that conscious awareness that we that we need to have to create space for ourselves. And so so most leaders find themselves living in one or two of those energies and they don't spend a lot of time in the other energies and so the coaching work that i do is to really help them expand themselves and expand that repertoire of projecting the right energy at the right time right so when we project the right energy we show up 
and the correct energy, we actually make a much larger impact. And we and we we actually get a lot more done. And 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 we also help other people connect with that energy as well. And 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 for them, that's a very important piece in leadership as well, if they can connect with our energy. Outstanding. Uh, uh, I'm running low on time, so Marcel. Yeah. <laughs> What's the best way for someone to get in contact with you if they want to chat with you, if they want to get sure. some advice from you? Absolutely. Well, um, no, number one is just Google me. So my name is Marcel and then, you know, Donna, D-A-A-N-E is, is my name. Otherwise, Google one of my books. Um, you know, uh, if you Google five, five energies of horrible bosses, my name will come up or, or the, my other book is called Headstrong Performance. Um, you know, that that would come up. Of course, I'm on I have my own website. MarcelDowner.com. Um, I also have uh, my company website, which is level5partners.com, and five is a V, right? So Roman Roman five. So so that's another way to get hold of me. There's a great assessment on that website, by the way, that, we, that you can do for free to test your energy to see what energy you actually project as a leader. So that's level5partners.com, and then five is is a level v partners.com. And of course, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. I'm everywhere else as well so uh, it'll be quite easy to find me awesome thank you marcel for taking some of your time to share your your wisdom with us uh, that you've learned over your time from being a youth a youthful man going into the, the navy as an intelligence analyst and to where you are now and with science and spirituality thank you and thank you so much for for you know having me and and for your mission as well right keep up the great work and uh you know keep inspiring keep helping because you know everybody needs it Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome, my friend. Right. Speak to you soon. Thanks.